Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I am Louise Palenker. Here on Media Path, we point you down the path toward interesting media choices. We cover everything streaming and cable, network, online books. And what we love more than anything is getting to talk to somebody who has had such a huge effect on the culture. And today we're going to chat with the one and only Pat Boone, one of the biggest selling recording artists of the 50s and 60s. He's a composer and an actor and a writer and a television personality and a motivational speaker. And Pat's uh, standing by in our beautifully appointed green room and he'll be with us in just a couple of seconds. But first, Wheezy, before I let you do your picks, I'm so excited. When we get reviews, it should be a holiday. Yes. I'm going to read these reviews very quickly. This is from... Divine but humble. I love it. Not his real name. I love it. I've been loving this podcast, having been late to discover it. Fritz and Louise are superb interviewers, knowledgeable and funny, and ask great questions. They choose fascinating guests and allow them the time and space to talk and explore their lives. Looking forward to more. Yay. Well, thank you so much, thank divine so person. Much. Here's another one. This is a great podcast. The guests are so impressive. You not only are entertained, but you learn as well. Hearing the behind the scenes stories is something I really enjoy. You're going to hear some today. And that sets me media path apart from other podcasts i listen to definitely worth your time and that's from pop pop culture yearbook is that is that true well god bless all of you we appreciate you being here thank you for your reviews and you can review us on apple podcasts or wherever and we'll we'll read you on the air and we'll shamelessly uh promote whatever it is you're doing well fritz i uh- dina told us this week our producer dina that we were charting in in austria and israel that's unbelievable. So I'd like to give a shout out to those two countries in which several people live. Yeah, yeah, they do. Austria and Israel right. are two bucket list countries where I want to visit before I'm too old to get on a plane. Austria, because Vienna is the seat of the greatest symphonic music in the history of the world. And Israel, because it's the history of everything, including the three basic uh, religions and so I'm looking forward to that. I've been to both locales. We have a big map with where you can put pins in. I've got pins in both of those uh, locations. And did you know, while we're speaking of Israel, that Mr. Pat Boone wrote the lyrics to Exodus? Wow! I God did gave not this know land that. to me. He did, and he can tell us all about. Oh, that. Oh, I can't wait to. I just saw that on Turner Classic Movies again so good. recently. Yes. Go good. ahead. What, what, what's your selection? This so week? this week, Fritz, you and I are both reviewing titles that feature the name Lincoln, while neither one has anything to do with Lincoln. (laughs) And so we could, if you're up to it, we could change the name of this show to the Lincoln Podcast. That sounds great. Any thoughts? Okay. So I read The Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls, the author of A Gentleman in Moscow, which is another book that I really loved. So in 1954, rural Nebraska, 18-year-old Emmett Watson is driven home by the warden after serving 15 months at a juvenile work farm for involuntary manslaughter. With their parents both gone, Emmett's plans include picking up his eight-year-old brother, Billy, and traveling west in search of a new life. But hiding in the warden's trunk were two fellow inmates with alternative ideas which push and pull Emmett and Billy further from their carefully laid itinerary and closer to a rollicking adventure and a better understanding of themselves and their world. Bustling with charm, excitement, and remarkably intriguing characters, the Lincoln Highway inspires a deep look at the intersection of desire and integrity and the choices we make in those critical moments. It's a fantastic journey through the 1950s in America, and it comes to us from the man who wrote another favorite of mine, as I said, A Gentleman in Moscow. I recommend both books. So it's not about Lincoln, and it is not about really the Lincoln Highway, because the Lincoln Highway literally was across the street from my house growing up in suburban Philadelphia. Yes, and Billy, the young boy in the book, he's driven a map of how they're going to take the Lincoln Highway all the Uh way to California and start their new lives. They never quite seem to make it all the way to the Lincoln Highway, but so it's more of like a, a proverb or a parable about their desire to get there. I love it. Well, last week I talked about Bosch Legacy, a series based on the novels of Michael Conley. This week I'm going to do another series from Michael Conley's work called The Lincoln Lawyer. It's on Netflix. This is the story of an idealistic lawyer, Michael Haller, who runs his practice out of the back of a Lincoln town car. He takes on big and small cases around Los Angeles. Lincoln Lawyer was a movie starring Matthew McConaughey a few years ago. Now, in it, McConaughey oozes charm and style while doing the Lord's legal work. Think Batman with a law degree. This series is different. Mickey Haller is played by Manuel Garcia Rolfo. 
He's really known in Mexico. He's a Mexican actor who's done a few movies and TV shows. His most, mo, uh, his most notable appearance was in 2017, the remake of The Magnificent Seven starring Denzel Washington. In the series, Mickey's rougher. He's less confident. He's hit some emotional speed bumps in his life and is on his redemption tour. He kind of has that in common with Harry Bosch. The series is written by David E. Kelly, so you know there are great plots and fun forensics. In the series, he's got two ex-wives, one who adoringly still works in his office, and the other is a prosecutor who also still holds a torch for him that he occasionally works with on cases. So that's the only part of the show that's complete and utter fantasy. Fun watching, though. Like Bosch, there are all L.A. locations, so it's fun to pick them out as Mickey looks out from the back of the Lincoln heading toward a clandestine meeting with a complicated client. It's 10 episodes. I think five or six have dropped, and it's on Netflix, and I'm really enjoying it. I've watched a few of those, and did you realize that the first wife, he has several ex-wives, but the first ex-wife is played by Nev Campbell, who oh, is yeah. in Party of Five, which a lot of people enjoyed while they were going. And, and like nine Scream movies, right? Yeah. No, she's really... Yes. Yeah, she's a lot of she looks fantastic, she's too. She's done a lot of screaming. She's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Let's yep. introduce Pat Boone. I'm going to do it. It yeah. is such a pleasure to talk with Pat. He's recorded some of the biggest hits of the 1950s and 60s, 25 singles in the top 20. Like, ain't that a shame in 1955? I almost lost my mind, 1956. And maybe the song he's best known for, or when you hear the name Pat Boone, it's the immediate association. You make Love Letters in the Sand and April Love, both in 1957. He does a fantastic show on Sirius XM Radio 50's Gold, the Pat Boone Hour. I listen all the time because I am his target demographic. (laughs) I'm in the September of my baby boomer existence, and I love it. He picks some favorite songs, many times making a theme out of them. This week he did one on female hit makers, and on it he explained, and I'll get him to further extrapolate on that, that Kay Ballard has a muscular voice. Do you remember saying that? (laughs) I think that's pretty accurate. The fun thing is that whoever he's talking about, he probably worked with them. I love the anecdotes you do on that show, Pat. It's just a lot of fun, and I wish it were longer on on the air. Nice to welcome you, sir. Hey, good to see you, Fritz. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I'm glad to know you're listening to that show. You know, uh, I've been so amazed, uh, and the mail I'm getting a lot of times are from businessmen 50 and over who uh, make it a point to listen to it all the time. In fact, I went to a doctor at UCLA the other day. I had a I've got a, a little growth on the back of my head from too much sun, and it's got to come off. In fact, he's, they've taken it off now. They think they've got to go back in again. But when he walked in with his mask on to introduce himself, he said, I want you to know I'm a fan of yours, and I listen to your 50s on five, or 50s gold, I think we call it. Mm-hmm. Every week, I love it. I mean, so the guy that's going to be my surgeon <laughs> is telling me this is This is good. Show. He has an inv- he has a vested interest in making you healthy again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's great. Well, I, I just want to say one thing, Wheezy. Cause this is important for me to get this off my chest. Mm-hmm. The first television talk show I ever did as a comedian was Pat Boone's show, taped at Knott's Berry Farm. People in your audience would drift in and out between roller coaster rides, and your your show was like part of the tour there. And it was my first like three or four minute performance, and you made me so comfortable, and I'll never forget you for that. That was like that was forty years ago. Yes, it was <laughs> forty years ago, and I tell you, I've still I was thinking of you this morning because no matter where I go for the last many many years. I carry that toiletry kit that you gave everybody who played in your golf tournament. <laughs> wow. The right, right size. It carries everything I need to take with me for to try to look like myself uh, on the road. <laughs> You're doing a good job, sir. You, you were the star power in our Salvation Army golf tournament at Lakeside Golf Club, and people loved to play because you were part of it. If you have any uh, of those stuffed in your garage somewhere. <laughs> I'll see if I can find one for you. I've worn this one out because it was just perfect. But I love playing for you and with you in the uh, Salvation Army event because my wife's uh, grandparents were Salvation Army officials. Oh, wow. Colonel Colonel Overstake, that was her granddad, was still uh, still talked about with great respect amongst uh, the upper echelon and the, uh, the older people, I guess I should say, really in the Salvation Army. So that's part of my own heritage by marriage. And 
I've been making out my state plans and Salvation Army is figuring prominently in my, uh, what I want to leave behind. I want to know whatever I leave behind is going to be well invested in things that really matter. And so Salvation Army is one of those. I'm going to bite my tongue and not tell them ahead of time because I don't want to get too excited. (laughs) Uh, but, but they will be appreciative. But you, you were the star power at that golf tournament. We always loved having you there. And you were graceful with everybody and cordial, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you can, by the way, you can go ahead and mention it because uh, I've already been giving to them. In fact, the at their big uh, a getaway place north of L.A., mm-hmm. um, the where they bring people for the summer times, and uh, there is a, a cross at the top of a of a high hill and a path that leads up to it. And they've now called that the Pat and Shirley Boone faith walk. Oh, nice. Oh my goodness. At Salvation Army. And so of course I, they're part of my past and certainly part of my ongoing future. Wow. That is just fantastic. Good for you. Uh, They do so much good work. Now let's travel back in time, if you would, to when you're a young man beginning your career, because at your record label, they decided that what they were going to do was they were going to listen to some great music coming out of the rhythm and blues stations and give it to you and create a whole new sound that ultimately became rock and roll. So talk, talk to us about that. If you would, that was all, of course, very unintentional. Uh, That music rhythm and blues was also called race music. It was all totally black and they had their own radio stations. They had their own charts uh, you know, to, you know, to measure what records were happening, where radio stations and R and B, my brother was an R&B fan of, in Nashville when we were growing up a year younger than me, but I was, I was tuned into Bing Crosby, Sinatra, uh, Vic Damone, Eddie Fisher, if you remember, mm-hmm. uh, if you remember Eddie Fisher. And, uh, and so it was a big shock to me when I was offered a record contract on dot records. And the first thing they wanted me to record was a song by the charms on the due tone label. One heart, not enough, baby, <laughs> two hearts, make you crazy. One kiss will make you feel so nice. Two kisses to take you to paradise, two hearts, two kisses make one love. That was well, awesome. That's so good. We got a free <laughs> performance out of this. Fantastic. <laughs> And they, uh, that was a big hit on the Dutone label. Mine was on the Dot label. Mine was a million seller pop at a time when we were starting to call the music that had been only called R&B. The most polite name was R&B, rhythm and blues. But now they were starting to call it rock and roll. And, uh, and Bill Haley in the comments cemented that when he did Rock Around the Clock. Because up till then, in race music or black music, rock and roll, we're going to rock and roll all night long, baby. It didn't necessarily mean dancing. Mm-hmm. It could be whatever you wanted it to mean. <laughs> but, but as it caught on with teenagers, and that's, I happened to come right at that moment. Right. And that my next record was Ain't That a Shame, Fats Domino, his record in the R&B field. So it was number one, sold 150,000, which was huge. I did that same song. And we called it rock and roll and it sold a million and a half. And Fats was thrilled with it because he made more money by his own account from my record of his song than from his own. So what you're saying is that the radio stations were segregated. They weren't playing yeah. black artists on pop no, radio stations. They weren't. There was no they were unaware, really. The, the big white pop audience wasn't all white, but the mainly white audience knew nothing of rhythm and blues. It was a separated genre. But these, these songs were fun and funny sometimes. And um, so some of them were very erotic, but but some of them were just cute and funny. And so people like Mitch Miller back then, who was A&R artist repertoire at Columbia Records or DECA, I forget which, and, and Randy Wood at Dot Records, our little aggressive, aggressive independent label, they were they were picking up on these songs and, and having pop artists record them. So I did about eight or 10 R&B songs, several by Little Richard, Tutti Frutti, mm-hmm. Rip It Up, uh, Long Tall Sally, and then Blues Ballads by Ivory Joe Hunter and other R&B artists. They, they were, had already been hits, but they uh, were not known to the pop audience. And that went on for about two years, two and a half years, until the DJs, pop DJs, began to realize 
these songs came from somewhere. <laughs> and, yeah. and they would listen to the original record and then start asking, like Alan Freed in New York on WNEW would uh, ask the kids, which record do you want me to play? He'd play Little Richard's record of Tutti Frutti or Pat Boone's record of Tutti Frutti. At the beginning, uh, Little Richard sounded so unusual. They'd say Pat Boone's record because I happened to have come just when it, it was happening, starting to happen. But then gradually they'd say, play the original record and the cover record, as we called it, came to an end. Although up till then, we were all pop artists. We covered each other. It was not unusual for an artist to record other people's songs. Right. You know, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, for the first comment I want to make is your one of your gifts is your ability to pick the right song. I mean, you, you pick some great songs that made them viable for crossover. But you talked about Fats. You talked about Little Richard and uh, Big Joe Hunter as well. But I talked to Little Richard about you one time because I got into this discussion. I, I'm a huge rhythm and blues fan, and I got into this discussion with him about appropriation, which is the term they use now. They didn't use it back then. Yeah. And I said, how do you feel about that? He said, let me tell you something. Pat Boone and his crossover Tutti Frutti introduced me to millions more people than I ever would have met otherwise with my talent and made me a boatload of money, so I am forever in his debt. I really oh, turned my head around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, you, I mean, he gave you the answer that, that he knew was true, but sometimes people like Bob Costas and others would ask the question differently. How did you feel when Pat Boone covered your song, Tutti Frutti? And, and he would go with them kind of say, well, I have a tape of him saying I was a I was still washing dishes in a bus station in Macon, Georgia, when I and uh, I wasn't making no money yet because my <laughs> record, uh, nobody's paying me anything, but it was on the radio. And then when I heard Pat Boone had done my song, uh, then uh, I knew I threw the towel down and walked out. of it. I was going to make some money now. Yeah, because he was the writer of the song. Right. So he was mm -hmm. making. Oh, now he yeah. sold the copyright because he didn't know what that was. Somebody paid him like $50 for the copyright, the ownership of the song, which, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, they took advantage of him and other dark artists, black artists, uh, a lot uh, because they didn't know what that was. They didn't know the record business. And you're going to give them $500 for to use their song. Well, they'll take it, of course. Doesn't radio do that all the time? Sure. But uh, they didn't own their songs. And Richard realized eventually he had been ripped off. Mm -hmm. Well, you were kind of a, a Trojan horse in terms of introducing white kids to some wonderful music that would then lead to Motown and, you know, all kinds of, you know, like the the first industry really to integrate was was the music industry. Yeah. Little, not long ago. Uh, I, well, I lo for me, two years is not long ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I recorded an album of rhythm and blues classics with the original performers. Oh, that's a nice idea. Not just doing their songs, but redoing their songs with them. Wow, like who? So I did well, Smokey Robinson, Tears oh. in the Pool, Four Tops, Can't Help Myself. Oh. We were Family, Sister Sledge, which became the name of my album, We Are Family. Mm -hmm. That is the original artist and me. Uh, Celebration, Cool in the Gang, um, Get Down Tonight, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Oh, I'm, I'm a soul man with Sam Moore. Oh, cool. I did, I did Way of the World with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, wow. And I went to Augusta and recorded Papa's Got a Brand New Bag with James Brown. Oh, wow. wow. Said, hey, hey, Pat's got a brand new bag. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we, I, I just want to make a, a, a side comment on something you mentioned before, and that was that the complaint the R&B artists had in the 50s was that they weren't paid what they were worth in concerts or in record sales. And I don't yeah. know if you saw the movie Cadillac Records. It was about that same thing. Oh, yeah, I did see it. The yeah. Chess Brothers had yeah. um, uh, Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and yep. all these R&B artists and Chuck Berry. And everything, and instead of paying them what their royalties would have dictated, or paying them what they were worth, he would just buy them a new Cadillac, and that would assuage their desire yeah. for a while. But it still was way under what they were worth and what they. True, that was true because they honestly didn't know. They didn't even have management that knew, and so they would. Uh, you know, there was a group in Philadelphia uh, who went up to see a DJ. And they said, we come up with a song. We're a doo-wop group. A wop, bop, a loop. No, no, it was a, oh, it was Blue Moon. 
Bop up a bop a bop a bop bop a bop a bop a ding a dong ding blue moon blue moon blue moon no no music at all and uh, no instrumental music and they, and he got him signed to a record label and of course they got almost nothing for it Man. but it was a, a big big record and it took a couple of years for people that's my dog Shadow does your dog have a record deal <laughs> he's pretty good he can't sing at all. <laughs> Now, remember that? Remember when Frank Sinatra was trying to get in on the rock market? He hated rock and roll, mm-hmm. but his people around him said, "You got to do something, Chief." So, so he recorded a song with Dagmar yeah. called "Mama Don't Bark." It's so bad; <laughs> it, it's really horrible. There is a record. If if it is still one, Frank went out later and tried to buy up every record that <laughs> and destroy it. But he barked like a dog. <laughs> I can't sing the song, but it is on. If you go to um, Amazon and just type in Mama Don't Bark Frank Sinatra. There it is. He he couldn't stop it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Vision to Amazon. But it's some of mine that I don't care for, they're out there too. But but here's here's a factoid that you didn't know. Um Frank, I, who was certainly an idol of mine and Bing Crosby, the two of them. Frank recorded 1,500 songs, Holy all of them classics. Bing Crosby, I consider everything he ever did, 2,000 songs, classics. I have recorded 2,300 songs, more than either of them, more than any other artist in recording history, recorded 2,300 songs because I cut across genres. Mm-hmm. They didn't care about rock and roll, didn't want to do it. I did it many hits. They didn't care about country very much. They didn't care about gospel. Mm-hmm. They, they did some patriotic songs. I've done eight or ten patriotic albums, and uh, and and really gospel and spiritual themed. I'm in the gospel music hall of fame. Mm-hmm. Five gospel albums. So I just I was a recording fool. I loved the I loved the act of recording. I loved to sing a song I liked with musicians, and then know that it was there maybe forever for people to hear. So, 20- and, and in those days, it, it was about the single, right? I mean, it was the single and the B side. It wasn't about putting an album together. So, you could record a song a week and just keep throwing them out there. And many did. And that's why I hold another record in the record business, which is 240, no, 220 consecutive weeks without ever being off the charts. Wow. Because Randy didn't wait until a record got off the chart before he brought my next record out. Right. My record dropped from seven to 10 out came my next record. And if it dropped from 30 to 42 out came my next record. So for over four years, almost four and a half years, I always from 55 through 59 into 60 had one, two records on the charts at all time, one going up, one going down. Elvis went to the army after three years. Yep. And his record string was broken. And the Beatles, after three years, began to just put out albums, not singles. Mm-hmm. And so Elton John comes the closest to my record of 157 weeks without ever being off the charts. But I, I've been on, I was on for uh, 220 consecutive oh weeks. Gosh. I was just a recording fool. I loved it. I was making movies. I had four kids. I was, so I was doing other things besides record and make movies and television. But anytime Randy Wood at Dot called me and said, Pat, we got a song I want you to do today. I was in the studio. Did you take any heat from racists in that time period when you were recording the music of of black artists and black songwriters? No, but since then, Mm -hmm. since then, people who maybe didn't live through the area have come up with this story that I was somehow taking something from them or I was impeding their progress. When, when Fats Domino, Little Richard, and many other artists have said publicly that my recording of their songs put them on the map. Then, uh, if I did it more than once, it would cause the DJs to wonder who this person is, who's, where's Pat getting his songs? And they would play the original and then bring them on. And recently, when I did that album, I told you about the R&B classics, uh, and I was talking to Santita Jackson, Jesse Jackson's daughter, mm-hmm. the Rainbow Coalition station in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I was promoting this record, this album. And she was asking me what it was like to record with James Brown and Smokey Robinson and the Four Tops. And uh, and I, I was telling her and the phone rang, uh, I, I guess, because she asked the engineer, uh, is that who I think it is on the phone? Yeah, put him on. And it was her dad, Jesse Jackson. Oh. 
And he, he got on, he said, I've been listening to it. We love Pat Boone in Chicago. In fact, he says, you know, we came to know him when his father-in-law, Red Foley, the big country singer, was singing our spirituals, mm. WLS in Chicago. And then we found out he had a son-in-law who was doing our, our rhythm and blues songs and making hits with those songs and then bringing the artists on his TV show mm. with them and making, making our music popular to an audience that up till then knew nothing of it or, and cared less. But helping our, he says, I'm going to say something I've never said before, but this is Jesse Jackson. I think Pat Boone did more for race relations and with his music in the 50s than any other artist. Wow. Now, about any other artist he might have said that about. Yeah. But uh, Jesse Jackson, knowing that I recorded all these songs, big hits, and then bringing Little Richard and Fats and singing with me on my own television show, making it all so palatable. And, and pleasing to this huge audience that up to then knew nothing about. At a time when sponsors were really cautious about putting African-American performers on a white TV show. And that's when I stopped my Chevy show. Mm -hmm. I was doing that for three years, and I was the youngest ever to have his own network television show at 22 mm -hmm. with Ella Fitzgerald, Nat Cole, Sammy Davis, all these other artists singing with me on my show. Chevrolet was taking the heat down in, in the South. And they, they told the ad agency, you know, if, if this keeps up, if Pat has all those black artists on, although they didn't use that word, that we, we're going to have to uh, maybe switch over to Ford. Oh, my God. And uh, so Chevy had already let the ad agency know I was going to have to quit having so many uh, R&B black artists. At that time, Harry Belafonte, the, large, the biggest entertainer in the world, mm -hmm. called me on, and said, I've been watching your show. I like the way you treat your guests, he said. Would you like me to come on? We can do something together. I said, are you kidding? I would love it, of course. I was still in college at, at Columbia University, by the way. Oh, my. Taking a full load and married. But but he um, he said, I'll come on the show and we'll do, you know, uh, Jamaican Farewell and Deo, Banana Boat, you know, and sing some songs together. Well, when I told our production team and the network and the ad agency that, Harry Belafonte had called and wanted to come on with me. They, they had these sour, somber looks. We, we can't do it. I said, why? Well, you know, he's involved in civil rights. And uh, if we have him on, we'll lose Chevrolet. You got to remember now, this was late 50s. Yeah. yeah. And all the prejudice was still very deep in the South. Mm -hmm. And I so we're going to have to tell Mr. Belafonte, thanks, but no thanks. Well, I was stunned. Oof. They went on to another subject, and then I brought her back. I said, guys, this show is called the Pat Boone Chevy Showroom. If I have to say no to the biggest entertainer in the world, Harry Belafonte, who's been who's volunteered to come on my show, it's not the Pat Boone show. So I'm going to have to ask you to take the show from here. And I, I will, I'll just step aside. And, you, and actually, they talked me into staying on for the last four weeks of that season, and I, I quit the show. Um, James, Jamie Foxx heard about this recently. I don't know how, but I was at the gym about to walk in the gym and uh, a black guy comes out to get in his Escalade. And as I'm passing, he says, is that Pat Boone? <laughs> said, yes. And Jamie Foxx hopped out of the car. He says, and, and we shook at first. And he said, uh, is this true? I've he just heard that when you were a young singer and Harry Belafonte wanted to come on your show, and your sponsor wouldn't let him come on. You quit your show. I said, yes. How did you know? I don't, I said, I, it gets around. Well, it had been 40 years. <laughs> wow. But, you know, I was more active in civil rights than most people had any idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just through, through that music. But in 1960, uh, I was asked to come to South Africa and perform. And I told the promoters who were offering me a lot of money, and I was now like, I was 25, 26, um, offering me a lot of money. And I said, uh, I understand you have a policy that I don't know what it's called. I didn't know how to pronounce apartheid yet. Mm -hmm. uh, where if somebody wants to come see me sing and they have the money to buy a ticket, they can't come. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's our policy. But don't worry. You're going to be sold out. I, you sold out. I said, wait a minute. That's not my point. If they want to come hear me sing, they can't do it. 
well, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to come. I, I, I'm just not comfortable. I'm, I can't tell you how to run your country. We still got our problems in America, but, but no thanks. So I turned it down twice. They came back a third time behind closed doors. They said, if you'll give us your word as a gentleman that you will not mention this any time in the near future, that, uh, that we're doing it, the government will suspend apartheid for your concerts. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Let everybody know that anybody who wants to buy tickets can come to your shows only. And after that, you know, we'll go back to our normal policy. So I went in 1960. I had death threats in Durban, Pretoria, not Johannesburg, but but other big, big cities in South Africa. And it went great, sold out. I went to northern Rhodesia and did the same thing and came home. And and, you know, everybody got along. Uh, but they dropped the curtain back down on and Nelson Mandela was still in prison. But in 1960, uh, I'm proud of this. Uh, I couldn't talk about it till now, but mm-hmm. but it's, it is a matter of record that they the government suspended their policy of apartheid for my for my concerts. And then, of course, it was back in place the moment I left. But wow. uh, yeah, I Frank Sinatra and others went to South Africa eventually to a place called Sun City, which was outside Johannesburg and was a hotel and casino. And so somehow they got the government to to, to suspend a par- apartheid for that area, for that, that hotel in Sun City. So many white performers went there then, but they weren't appearing in Johannesburg, Pretoria, Durban, and <laughs> Fitch, mm-hmm. Fitch, you'll enjoy this, because there was a death threat in Durban, the first town on that tour, saying that, they came to the hotel. If you go on that stage with a non-segregated audience, blacks and whites and Indians all together, you won't leave the stage alive. Oh, God. I was not a, a move around the stage performer. I mean, I wasn't like Elvis. I'd go to the mic and just sing my songs and move a little. But in Durban, I moved around that stage rather briskly. <laughs> okay. I was going to at least moving be a target. Yeah. While, while you're talking about performing in other countries, I, I wanted to ask you about the the music business and the touring business back then. That's before the internet and satellite radio, and so it took longer for your hits to sort of creep across the oceans and turn up at the radio stations in other countries. And so, was there as much international touring? Then, as there is now, did you go to Europe several times in Asia? I did, I did, but I have to disagree with you because of Armed Forces Radio oh, and because right. the record business. I mean, Cliff Richard was a big star in England. Mm-hmm. I don't know if did you know that name, Cliff Richard? Yes, I did. Of course, yes. And uh, and they called him the British white uh, British Pat Boone, and I would in in return, if I was in England, would call myself the American Cliff Richard. Okay. <laughs> No, we, we were well aware of each other's music then. And I had Andy Williams, many of us had hits in the 50s, late 50s in Great Britain. And of course, in Italy and, and around uh, into Europe. In fact, when Shirley and I were like 30 and we were in, in England on a, on a tour, but we, we were together and we could do a lot of uh, sightseeing. We were out in front of Buckingham Palace and I was trying to make one of those big guards standing up there and you're not supposed to talk to him. He's not supposed to talk to you. And, and I was trying to get his attention and say things to Shirley to make him laugh. Mm-hmm. And a brown skinned man standing off to the side watching came up to me, said, are you Pat Boone? And I said, yes, we love you in Persia. Aww. Wow. Persia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I've been told that uh, from people that were in China, they were picking up our, you know, armed forces radio and other radio and Germany, I recorded in German, in German language and in Germany. I recorded in Italy and, and, and had hits in Italy and all those. Radio countries. Luxembourg in Britain was big, too. That was like a broad, yeah. sweeping yeah. European radio station was it probably. Take long, really, American music and American movies were our chief export. And and I, I, I hate what's happened to a lot of it now, because both in music and in movies, we export some of the worst possible sides and that's not everybody not all movies are all music but a lot of it is things that that we don't want other people in other countries to identify us with with that music with hit bitches and hoes in their language mm-hmm. in the music 
and uh, movies with every conceivable foul thing in movies and supposedly showing Americans doing it. We used to be the envy of the world because the pictures we showed in America of, of America were upstanding, righteous, good families. The bad guys won. I mean, the good guys won. The bad guys always got caught. And now, you know, after Dallas, you know, TV shows like that and, and other shows where you showed what scheming, hypocritical people we could be, some people could be, um, then, you know, now they, we, they have excuse to call us the great Satan in Arab nations because they can point to much of our products now, our exports. A lot of the music, a lot of the movies, TV, of course. And we're, we're showing the most awful possible signs of America in our films and all that kind of entertainment. It's tragic. So, well, I, I, I produced a real downer in this program. No, well, we're, we're so happy to have you be honest about your feelings about that. I want to ask you one question, Weezy, and then I'll, but while we're on this, the music business is almost unidentifiable to what it was in the 50s and 60s when you recorded, but streaming is big. And has Spotify and Pandora and these other streaming services introduced your music to a new audience or made you more yes. accessible now, kind of given it a boost? Yes, I've got, I think they. Last count was like five million regular listeners on Spotify. Oh my gosh! Nice. And uh, and there's several others of the uh, and and they're going to be they're going to as they say archive all 2,300 of my recordings. Now that's going to be more than any other artist ever. And of course, uh, somebody figured out somebody that works for me just put my records and calculate how long it would take to just hear back to back mm -hmm. all the records I've recorded It'd be like two and a half weeks. <laughs> I think it's a good uh, commitment of time. I think that would be, <laughs> yeah, that would be time well spent. So I know yeah. you probably know that if, when you type someone, someone's name into Google, who's well known, such as yourself, it gives you not just search results, it also brings up some frequently asked questions. So we're going to play a little game where we'll see if you know as much about yourself as does Google. Are you ready to play our game? Ready. Uh, question number one, is Pat Boone a descendant of Daniel Boone? Definitely. Descended from James, his eldest. I've got the genealogy. And uh, he was born in 1734. I was born in 1934, 200 years apart. But he was a pioneer. He liked to go places where other people hadn't gone. He never did a heavy metal album. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're out ahead on this one. So yes, uh, you and Google, uh, that, that's a match. You both have the that's same exactly. answer. Charles Eugene Pat Boone was born in 1934 in Jacksonville, Florida, a descendant of frontiersman Daniel Boone. All right. right. Question now, number two. Reason, my, well, are you going to ask me about my name, Pat? No, I'm, Pat is your third name, right? So it's Charles Eugene yeah. Patrick Boone, correct? Well, it's it's... It was never my name. Oh, uh, until my parents. I was their first child, and and no amniocentesis, so they knew they were going to have a girl, and they picked <laughs> up Patricia, and it had ah. been short. Pat, when Pat gets here, but when I got there on close inspection, <laughs> wait a minute, this is not a girl. <laughs> like I'm no doctor, but this is not a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and so they named after my two grandfathers on my birth certificate, Charles and Eugene, and they kept calling me Pat anyway. Oh. Now it's caused problems on my driver's license and other things. And, and I have to often sign Charles E. Pat Boone, not just or just Charles Boone, but uh, but but Charles E. Pat is it. But Pat, because I was never called Patrick, uh, I just was Pat. Well, Fritz has similar situation because nowhere on his birth certificate does it say Fritz. He can really? tell you. Yeah, because go ahead. Well, uh, I know I, I got in trouble with passports and everything just like you did. My all the all the men on my father's side of the family were named Frederick. Oh. And all, going back six or seven generations. And my yeah. grandfather, who was 50% German, used to call me Fritz, which means little Frederick in German, in order uh, to distinguish uh, me from my father. Now, when I was a kid, I hated the name. It just sounded awful. But then when I got older and realized the, you know, it, it's different and interesting, and so I kept it and liked it. Right, but his first name is Joseph, so the Fred part is his middle name. And then mm -hmm. he's not called Freddy or anything. He's just called Fritz. So he has a lot of explaining to do to cops, too. He gets pulled over quite often. Mm -hmm. All right. Question number two is, uh, let's see, 
This one I think you'll get. What is Papoon's most famous song? Or are you asking me or Fritz? No, this no, is you. this is a frequently asked question on Google, and we want to see if your your answer matches Google's answer. Love letters in the sand. Mm-hmm. Well, they have, let's see, uh, Boone, which they call you Boone, which simplifies things. We don't have to get into the whole Pat or Eugene part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Boone has had over 25 singles reach the top 20 on the U.S. singles chart, including the number one hits, Ain't That a Shame, 1955, I Almost Lost My Mind, 1956, Don't Forbid Me, 1957, Love Letters in the Sand, 1957, April Love, 1957, and Moody River, 1961, I'll Be Home, 1956, reached number one in the U.K., just as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but Love Letters in the Sand sold about five million singles. Plus, April Love was that was that was very big as well. Huge. Right? It was it was my. I love that record. It was written for me by Paul Francis Webster and Sammy Fain, two great Academy Award writers. They also wrote Friendly Persuasion, well, with Dimitri Tiomkin, and of course that was another of my big records, the the title song to Friendly Persuasion movie, but. Um, what was, what was our point? Of, oh, My point oh, was oh, they oh, didn't oh, even have like one famous song. They just rattled off like 10 songs. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I had 13 million sellers yeah. and six number ones and then all the other so more top 10. In fact, the, the records show that in the 50s, the whole decade of the 50s, Elvis was number one. I was close number two. And I was ahead of the Beach Boys, ahead of, of a whole bunch of other Ray Charles, a bunch of big, big singers. Because I just kept Elvis and I just kept coming record after record. As soon as uh, one of my records went off the uh, down the charts, my next record came out. He did the same thing, and so we were just two boys from Tennessee matching each other, hit for hit. I had forty-one chart records in the fifties. He had forty, mm. and I only had one more because I had an eleven-month head start on him. Right. Mm-hmm. And he was my opening act the first time that we met, by the way. Wow. I don't know if you knew that. Wow. Yeah, you tell that story in your in your video podcast, and it's you just talk about how shy he was to be meeting you. Yeah. And he says, I didn't know how to talk to you, man. I said, what do you mean? You were a star. I said, I'd only been recording since March, Elvis. <laughs> you had three hit records, and I didn't know how to talk to you. But he got over that shyness and then some. Yeah. And, uh, and we got to be good friends. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about Shirley, your late wife, who was a wonderful philanthropist and did so much for so many people. And she she gives you lineage into show business because her father, your father-in-law, Red Foley, was huge yes. country royalty in the 30s yes. and 40s. He did a big country hit, Chattanooga Shoeshine Boy, which you can still hear right. on, uh, on uh, Willie Nelson's country channel. Yeah. Did you ever, how, how, was there competition between you and your father-in-law? Did he try to dictate to you how to be a star? Was he, no, was he supportive? No, we couldn't help each other. It was crazy. I mean, I was not interested in country music yet. I was interested in Shirley, Shirley Foley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I even wrote a song at that time and played it for Eddie Arnold, who said, that's, that's nice, but it's not for me. <laughs> he let me down easy. But uh, I eventually did record that song, but but Red, he was, his was all country, and I was into Frank Sinatra and and uh, Bing Crosby and pop music. So I, I didn't ask him for help, and and of course he wasn't volunteering any because, I mean, I was doing rock and roll, and he knew nothing about that. I mean, when I got going, it was I was a teen idol, and I was singing nothing but rock and roll for about a year. And uh, and I went on his TV show and sang. Uh, let me see, I forget Tennessee Saturday Night, I think, with Red, and we sang together. And then he came on my show, and I think we sang Tennessee Saturday Night mm. <laughs> that we both could sing and both knew. Uh, but so we swapped going on each other's television shows. But no, he didn't uh, try to tell me that one thing I learned from him though, which I don't know if I ever told him, is that. I, I learned to mean every syllable that I was singing. Mm. And that was one, that if I didn't even like the song, I was going to sing it and mean it. Mm-hmm. And I did a few songs like that. But uh, Red, there was something, you could hear his heartbeat oh. in every in every vowel of his music. Wow. That's a good way to describe and, it. Uh, that's, that's what, I mean, it was a deep baritone, it had a wide range for baritone, but... But people loved him. Men loved him. 
women loved him, dogs, cats loved him, goats <laughs> loved him. And uh, you know what was interesting about those early country stars? You know, you listen to Ernest Tubb, you listen to uh, Hank Williams, yeah. you listen to Loretta Lynn, and you realize their appeal, particularly to a country audience, yeah. was that they sounded like just a regular person singing on the front porch. There, there, there was no polish in their voices. There was yeah. no pretense. It sounded like somebody singing to themselves when they were riding in the car. And I right. think they're... they're um, their sort of un, unpolished nature is what made them so attractive, particularly to blue collar people back in those days. Authenticity. Yeah, that's right. There was a, an authenticity. Mm -hmm. They weren't copying anybody. They were originals. I mean, every one of them, neither none of them sounded like anybody else. Mm. And they were singing songs that grew out of people's hearts and experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, those weren't made up. They did rhyme usually. <laughs> but uh, but they the songs came out of people's real experience. So that's why so many bar songs and so many motel songs and so many truck driver songs is because and then out in the dusty dirt roads and mm -hmm. gone fishing. And I mean, these were things that people lived and the way they lived. And these sounded like the folks that were living. them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you heard, Ren, this is in recent news, that you, you are featured in the White House record collection. So what is, what is the White House record collection? Well, it was intended to serve as a window to the outside world so that the presidents could learn and better understand the musical state and tastes of the nation. So the first collection was put together by Johnny Mercer. The second collection was compiled by John Hammond. The records are stored in vinyl binders with the White House seal on them. And you, you're in there, Mr. Bill. And I'm in there. I, didn't, yeah. I never knew that existed. You're oh, telling me. Yeah, crazy. it exists. And now I learned from you, shortly after learning that, I learned from you on your video podcast that when you went to Graceland, you in a house that looks very similar to the White House, you found your records in Elvis's collection. Oh, yes. Right. That's awesome. Including... Pat Boone reads from the Bible. See, he was he was a repressed Christian. I mean, <laughs> when I say repressed, I mean he 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 uh, couldn't. He told me he said when I went to see him in, at the International Hotel when he made his comeback, and I was up there in the in this dressing room, and I said he said to me, "I wish I could go to church like you do." I said, "Well, why don't you?" He says, because I distract and I, they want me to sign, the kids want me to sign bulletins and and it would just be a distraction. I said, don't you think it happens to me when I go to church? Mm -hmm. If I go to church with people, I'm not a member, the kids line up. They, I mean, that was in the earlier days. And just go sit some, I'll, I'll sign your bulletin after church, kids, uh, and then go sit down and worship like, like they are, like they're there for. And then afterwards, they'll take your sign bulletins to, to school and the kids said, where'd you get that where were you with elvis your church can we come <laughs> said, let it be an evangelical oh, outreach. That's funny. Uh -huh. and he said i can't do that I, I i get i just know i'm a distraction i said well i know that i'm a distraction too but i sit there and worship like everybody if they want to look at me let them i want them to know that i'm there for the same reason uh but he says do you know oral roberts i said yes i'd like to talk to him sometime I said, let me give you a clue. Your name is Elvis Presley. You get <laughs> well, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I say, I, I want the number for Oral Roberts University. When somebody answers, say, uh, this is Elvis Presley. I'd like to talk, <laughs> I'd like to, talk to uh, President Roberts. And in 30 seconds, he'll be on the phone. He just said, I can't do that. He Socially, Fritz, he was... Uh, he was un uncomfortable socially. Mm -hmm. When I shook hands with him that first time in uh, Cleveland, I reached, I said, hi, Elvis, Pat Boone. Nice to meet you. I said, um, uh, Bill Randall thinks some big things ahead for you, maybe with RCA Victor. I don't know about that, but I, I hope so. <laughs> and he leaned back against the wall and, and, uh, and, and looked down and out of the top of his eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The musicians kind of closed in around him. And I, I, I didn't know if he's shy or nervous or what. And that's when he said later, I didn't know how to talk to you. But when I reached out and shook his hand, he let me shake his hand, but he didn't shake back. Nobody had taught him at that point. Not his mom or firm daddy. Handshake. Yeah. yeah. He taught him to give a firm handshake yeah. back. He learned, of course. But when I first shook hands, I, I squeezed his hand, but he didn't squeeze back. 
You know, it's interesting when you're a little kid and, and when you're a teenager, no one walks up to people and shakes hands. They, they go, hey, how you doing? So you have to learn as a young man at 20 or 18, you have to learn how to shake hands because it's just not something that teenagers, that's not how they greet each other. Plus, right. Pat, we, Weezy and I interviewed the lady that really wrote uh, oh, yeah. one of the definitive Elvis books. So this <laughs> is, you'll find this name. interesting. Her name is Sally Hodell. She wrote a book that you need to read. It's called um, Elvis Presley, Destined to Die Young. And she goes into his family history and about how he had he had this dysfunction and disease in like nine of the 11 bodily systems that were what? causing him to self-medicate just to feel normal. So what we kind of like you know, assigned to him is that, oh, he dr he died of drug addiction. Well, he was just yeah. trying to feel okay. Yeah. He was taking pharmaceuticals. He wouldn't take any illegal drugs. He was just trying to regulate how he felt because his digestive system was a mess. His, his um, all kinds of different systems in his body were not functioning properly. He felt unwell most of the time. And in addition to that, Pat, and going to your previous point, um, she lays the groundwork for, you know, several generations back where these diseases came hereditarily through uh, his mom and his grandparents. But he, he apparently never felt above his raisin in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, big, and, and that lasted the rest of his life. That's why he surrounded himself with all the kids he grew up with, all the people that yeah. moved into Graceland, because yeah. he was comfortable in that environment. And I mean, speaking to your shyness, he probably never felt uh, up, up to where he really was socially. Yeah, you've explained it. I didn't know some of that that you just taught me, told me about. But I, I described it as not socially comfortable. Mm -hmm. Can you excuse me one second? Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, Don or uh, Casey. Well, we can wrap this up right now. Yeah, we so want to first give you a chance to talk about your book and the movie, but very quickly get that plug in there. Mulligan is the movie you're in where you play a retired uh, golf pro. And the book, If, with the most interesting cover, is, uh, and tell me if I describe this properly, is, is a book that sort of helps you along in understanding the more secular nature in the United States now and how you can be a person of faith by reading it. Well, that's not a good description. Okay. It, 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 it is, um, it's an unusual book, and I know I'm going to get a lot of criticism, but I'm, I'm saying this in love to the hundred and to over half the population that doesn't go to service of any kind, mm -hmm. worship service. They're not sure there's a God. They don't know if there's a heaven or hell. And, and I, I'm, my heart's breaking for these people. They're not interested in a religious book. They're not interested in religion. But they're not going to. They're not going to ignore this cover. That's fantastic. The four corners look like they're singed, like it was pulled out of a fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this warning sign says, "Not religious, mm -hmm. life or death." Wow. Oh wow. And then the bottom line is the everlasting choice we all must make. And what I'm telling people that just simply don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know what God says. They don't know if there's a God. And so I'm, they're not interested in truck stops and places like that, picking up a, a religious book. But if it says it's not religious, and what does it mean? What's it if? If what? And, and really, if is heaven or hell, not because I say it, but because God says it. And, and, but the cho choice to be made is ours. His choice, God's choice, is that we come to heaven. And he's done everything uh, even God could possibly do to see we come. But we have to let him know we want to. Mm -hmm. And and it's our choice. We make the choice. And, and for that matter, we're making the choice, whether we know it or not. And so I'm reaching out to people, and they're going to say, some critics can say, you're telling me if I don't believe what you say in this book, I'm going to hell. I said, I'll say, forget what I say. Scratch my everything out I say in this book. I'm just trying to make you aware of what God says. He's your creator. He's the one that will determine where you spend the next life, the next existence. But you determine which will it be. And you have to want to go to heaven uh, and let him know you want to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's why I'm saying in, in all the love I, that I feel that... Um, that I may be able to reach a lot of people who just simply don't know that they're making that choice right now, whether they know it or not, and that the God who loves them and died for them wants them to come be with him. Mm -hmm. So that book is, uh, it'll be coming out in uh, 
early September. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're not going to take any more of your time, but I want to tell you what a personal thrill it is to get to revisit with you after all the support you've shown through the tournament and early in my career. You're such a gentleman and such a great icon, and it's been an honor, Pat. It really has. Well, you're a good man, too, and that good lady next to you. And um, and, and if, if you want, I could still tell you a few more stories on another time. Oh, we would love oh, that. We'll, we'll do that. Have, uh, as a matter of fact, when the book comes out or the movie comes out, we'll have you back on and we'll promote it for you. I'll save the story about when I embarrassed myself, the most embarrassing moment in my life in front of the Queen of England. I'll save that one. Oh, my God. It's a good tease. And oh, we'll I talk bet. about the book. <laughs> All right. I think we could get you and the Queen on together and we could clear that whole thing up. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's, let's do it. All right. Just, stay well, my friend. <laughs> stay well. Thank you so much, Pat. All right. Here come yeah. our closing credits. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at MediaPathPod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Pat Boone. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Planker here with Fritz Coleman and Pat Boone, and we will see you along the media path. Take a picture with you by the screen.